Just a reminder to our Speculating Wildly About Crime listeners, this is for entertainment purposes only and solely the thoughts and opinions of our team. We do invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Hi, guys, and welcome to an all-new episode of Speculating Wildly About Crime. I am your host for today's show, and my name is Missy. Today, we're covering the case of Amy Lynn Bradley, and I want to know if you guys are familiar with this case at all. Yes. Okay. I really can't wait to actually dive in and speculate with you about this case. Amy Lynn Bradley's father, Ron Bradley, we're going to start with him, worked in the insurance industry, and he was gifted a vacation, this really nice week-long vacation on the Royal Caribbean's Rhapsody of the Seas. It was a big cruise ship, and this was in 1998, so this was the cool thing to do. And they were excited. So it was Ron, Iva, Brad, which is Amy's younger brother, and Amy. Now, Amy was invited to go on this cruise because the whole family's going, but Amy was a little bit hesitant. I want to tell you a couple things right now just about Amy so you can get a picture about maybe who she was, but she had recently graduated with a degree in physical education from Longwood University in Virginia. And she had attended the school after receiving a scholarship in basketball. So she was very sporty and athletic. And then she was also a lifeguard at one point and a really strong swimmer. Now, I do want you to note that because that will come back later. The only thing that Amy really didn't was open water. She wasn't a huge fan of the ocean. That scared her. So when they had said, hey, let's go on this cruise, she didn't love the idea of that itself. But she said, you know what, her younger brother, Brad, who was 21, he was going and she really wanted to spend this time with her family and especially with Brad because the whole family was really close. So she did decide, yeah, let's do it. So they leave port on March 21st, 1998, and they're leaving San Juan, Puerto Rico, and they're headed toward Aruba, which we all know is Cindy's favorite place. And everything is going really well. So even though she was a little bit hesitant at first, she's having fun. The water's beautiful. She's sending postcards to her friends. She's having a wonderful time. And as they're getting into Aruba, they have this formal night. So everyone's getting dressed up. She's beautiful. And they go to this formal dinner on the cruise ship. And all of these waiters are actually paying some attention to Amy, which her mom, Iva, notices. It starts to get a little weird because Amy's not at the table. And Iva says that one of the waiters is actually coming up to the table and asking for Amy by name. And the waiter states that you know, they were just wondering if Amy wanted to go to a bar called Carlos and Charlie's, which is in Aruba. When Amy does come back to the table, Iva does tell her about this situation and Amy is, I'm not going to go hang out with them. And by the way, these crew members give me the creeps. So the next day they're hanging out in Aruba. Everything's wonderful. So Amy and her family go dancing and it's a nightclub having a Calypso party. And Amy is actually enjoying this band called the Blue Orchid. When they're on their break, Amy is seen dancing with the bass player of the band, who is known as Yellow. And his actual name is Alistair Douglas. Amy's drinking and having fun. And her parents decide they're going to go to bed. It's one o'clock in the morning. They're tired. So they go up to their room. They're telling their kids, okay, don't stay up too late, whatever. They're both grown adults, but all the usual things that you would say as a parent. Then at 3.30 in the morning, Brad decides he's also going to go to bed. They have a little key card. So they can scan into their room and it will tell you what time that you're scanning in. So they know that he came into his room about 3.30 and Amy shortly is after him. It's about 3.35. The only thing about this key card is that you could scan in to get into the room and then they know that you're into the room. But if you leave the room, there's nothing that's going to say that you're leaving the room. Amy and Brad are talking out on the balcony and Brad says he loves her. He's going to go to bed. He's tired. Amy decides she's going to stay out on the balcony. Now, I did read that. Amy had told Brad that she wasn't feeling well, that she was feeling a little sick. So she was going to just stay out there and get some more fresh air. At 5.30 in the morning, Ron, so that's Amy's dad, wakes up and he looks out on the balcony and he can see Amy 
sitting out on the balcony, but all he can see is from her waist down. So he can just see her legs. And Ron's, I'm not going to bother her. We're about to port because they were actually coming into carousels. The boat's going relatively slow coming into port. So don't let her be. She's fine. But then at six o'clock in the morning, Ron wakes up and he discovers that Amy's not there. Amy smoked. Amy's cigarettes and her lighter are not there. But everything else of Amy's is, and that's including her shoes. Ron knows his daughter. He knows that this is not like her to just leave and not tell him. He's looking all over the ship or where he can look at the ship at six in the morning. He's starting to panic. And by 6.30 in the morning, he goes back to the room and he wakes up everybody else. And he says, I can't find Amy. Iva and Ron right away are like, we need to report this. They tell the captain, hey, we need to search the ship for our missing daughter. But the captain is, we can't. First of all, it's too early in the morning. We can't say anything on the loudspeaker. We don't want to pass a photo around. We don't want to alarm our other guests. So Ron and Ivar, we really need to also not dock. Like when we get there to port, we can't let anybody off the ship. We can't find her daughter. She's got to be on the ship. But the captain, we can't do that either. That is against protocol. We cannot hold people on the ship. We have to allow them to disembark. They're freaking out at this point. Of course. Why wouldn't they be? Brad, this is Amy's younger brothers. I can't just sit here. I need to go start searching the ship as well. So he's searching the ship. He runs into, and this is according to Brad, runs into Yellow. So Alistair Douglas, who was the bass player of the band that Amy was seen dancing with shortly before she went missing, he sees him in, I am assuming like a stairwell or they were passing each other. And according to Brad, Yellow says to him, I'm sorry to hear about your sister. And of course, Brad thinks this is weird because the only people that know other than the family would be the captain and maybe some crew members, but this was the band. Do you know at this time if there were any I know the captain was we can't really do too much but did he or she say to any of the crew members can you go take a walk around the ship can you look places they said they were going to search the ship the captain and the crew I think it was when they were docking like later on we'll search it after everyone gets off of it which doesn't really make sense when they do disembark the ship there is a announcement finally made on the loudspeaker just asking for Amy to go to this, I don't want to say the front desk, I can't quite remember what it would be called off of the cruise ship, but basically, Amy, Lynn Bradley, please come to the, whatever it was. What so, use is that going to do when everyone's disembarking the ship? No one's going to be paying attention to that. I don't know about you, but if I was coming into port to go like see this cool island, I'm not going to see on the ship. I don't even know how many people were on this ship at this point. I just did a quick search for Royal Caribbean missing persons protocol and I'm skimming, but this says like once a passenger is reported missing, crew members might announce the person's name over the loudspeaker while conducting an onboard search. Crew staff will likely review security footage. And this is mainly talking about if somebody goes overboard, but another line that was highlighted per Google for me was once a guest or crew member is reported missing to guest services, Royal Caribbean policy requires crew to immediately inform cruise's main control center called the bridge, as well as the ship staff, captain, and security officer. It sounds like they just have to report it, but they don't have to do anything about it. But this was 1998. Just going to say that. So yeah, that post-updated policy is like, just tell somebody and... Maybe we'll do something. And even Iva says this in the cruise ship killer show that basically you're in foreign waters. They they don't have to do anything. You're an American that goes missing on a ship in a different country. That is really terrifying. If you think about it. Even at the podcast I listened to was discussing how basically they get bonuses if there's like an incident free trip. So that is a direct incentive for them to not report anything. I will say to you, Dina, thank you for bringing that stuff up. Yes, ever since this case, there has been changes in cruise ship policies on what to do when somebody goes missing or goes overboard. Now there's actually a thing 
um, on the ship, from what I understand, that alerts crew right away if somebody goes overboard. But in 1998, that wasn't a thing. And in this case, might have helped these changes. Are they good enough? Who knows? To go back to Amy's family, they have no idea what to do. So they decide to get off the ship because they're looking around. The ship, like they can't find her. They think maybe she got off the ship. Maybe she's on the island and uh, carousel. So let's go see what we can do here. They try to go to the American embassy that is closed. They try to contact the FBI, but there's nothing that they can do for 24 hours. And unfortunately, they're left with this terrible decision of what do we do? If we go back on the ship and she's not on the ship, then what if she's on the island? Or what if she's on the ship? They they have to make this decision. And so the decision basically is that we're going to stay on this island and see if she's here. They watch the ship leave and find out later. There was a, a, sorry, a search of the bathrooms, the common rooms, and anything that was out and about. No thorough search through the rooms. It was basically just public spaces. The FBI tells the Bradleys that they need to fly to St. Thomas and demand that they're getting back on that ship. So they go back on the ship, confront the captain. They tell him, we know you didn't do a search. They do find two college students who tell them that they saw Amy or somebody who resembled Amy that morning at around 5.45 a.m. with Alistair Douglas, a.k.a. Yellow. The FBI and the police are like, okay, we're going to bring Yellow in for some questioning, see what he knows. They give him a polygraph. His story is that he left at 1 a.m. and he knows nothing about what happened to Amy. And he does this polygraph and he passes. The Bradleys are now launching their own investigation. They don't really have a ton of help. I know that there was a little bit of a search done in the water. I don't really know how extensive that search was in the middle of this. Like they do have to go home at some point, which is really unfortunate because they have to leave knowing that their daughter is missing. But Ron and Brad returned to Carousel a few months later and they're doing their own like footwork and they do find a cab driver on the island of Carousel who claims to have seen Amy the morning that she went missing. He recognized her green eyes because Amy had these like vibrant green eyes and that she ran up to the cab and she was desperate for a phone. Also, Brad does say within that few days that they were on the island trying to search for her, he thought he heard a woman's voice who sounded like Amy say his name. So they chased down this van that they thought that it came from, but there was nobody in the van except for the driver. So whether he actually heard Amy say his name or was he just hoping that he heard her, we don't know. None of these have been confirmed, but we're just going to go into a couple of the sightings of Amy. In 1998, there is a businessman named David Carmichael who was scuba diving in Carousel and they're out of the water, they're cleaning their gear off, and he notices there's a woman who's approaching him on the beach. And there are two men that are behind her, and she's very quickly trying to make her way to him. She gets relatively close, from my understanding, but before she can even say anything to him, these two men usher her off into a cafe. And he's thinking, okay, this is really strange. Like, he totally gets this red flag. Like, I need to figure out what's going on in this situation. So he starts to follow her. I should say, also, Amy has a bunch of tattoos. And he notices that she's being very showy. She's trying to show these tattoos to him. The tattoos that Amy have are very specific. So Amy does have a Tasmanian devil on her right shoulder blade. And it's a tattoo. Tasmanian devil that's spinning a basketball because she was really big into basketball. She also has a sun on her lower back, a Chinese symbol on her right ankle, and a gecko lizard around her belly button. He thinks at this point that maybe this is just like a domestic thing that's going on, and then he just leaves it. He had the best intentions. It's like those moments, and you never know how you're going to act in those situations, but... If he just followed through a little bit more. Yeah. Even if it was like just a domestic thing, but that what, that's what bothers me. You know, there's something up the situation. Like there's no trouble in reporting it. Do you know what I mean? Or there's no trouble in trying to step in and be like, are you okay? Do you need some help? David, when he's home, he sees Iva and Ron are doing all of these TV appearances, trying to get the word out about their daughter. So 
he sees one of these shows and he says, oh my gosh, this is the woman I saw on the beach. According to him, like he was about two feet from her. He knows that this is her. This is what he says. He is a hundred percent sure that this was Amy Lynn Bradley. We're going to go to August of 1998. Frank Jones was a private investigator and he reaches out to the Bradleys because of course he heard the story and he wants to help them out. According to Frank, he is a former U.S. military special operative and he believes that Amy might be part of this massive human trafficking ring. So he offers to go basically telling the family that I think I know where she is. I think I can help you guys out. He tells the Bradleys he can bring her home. It's only going to cost them $20,000. He hands to Carousel and he sees her on the beach with another guy and he's taking pictures and he sends those pictures back to Iva and Ron. And the pictures, we don't see her face. She's wearing a hat, she's covered up. But you do see a tattoo on her ankle that looks like Amy. So they were, yeah. This is Amy. She's there. She's alive. She's maybe not safe, but she's alive. We know that. They're like, yes, let's go get her. And Frank's saying, the only thing is I need to send a rescue mission now to go and get Amy. And it's going to be about $100,000. When Ron's former employer, the one who sent him on the cruise in the first place, finds out that this private investigator needs $100,000. He says, okay, I can help you. I'll loan you the money. But he wants to make sure that this is a legit thing that's going on. So we don't tell Frank. Frank goes off to do the rescue mission. And the former employer sends another private investigator that he had hired to keep an eye on Frank. About a week later, the Bradleys get a phone call from the employer's private investigator saying, your boy Frank here, he's a fraud. He is not a special operative with the military. In fact, he was taking all that money that you just gave him and he was using it to drink and party in the islands. Piece of shit, Frank. I will tell you, Frank did get prison time for this. Five years. Is it he's, wire fraud? Yes, I want to say it was. An extortion. Terrible person. Also, I will say the pictures that he did have of Amy, were in air quotes, Amy and this other guy on the beach, he had hired models and the tattoo on the ankle was a stencil to look like Amy's tattoo. We're going to go on to our next sighting of Amy or somebody who looked like Amy. Again, none of these are verified sightings. This was in January of 1999 and there is a naval officer who is in a brothel in Carousel. And he is approached by a woman who comes up to the table that he's sitting at. And she says, my name is Amy. I need help. I need to get out of here. And he's like, why can't you just go out the door? And she says, because they're holding me against my will and I can't. This is not reported to anyone until 2002. He does not report this incident because he is in the Navy and he doesn't want to get in trouble being in a brothel because he's not supposed to be. But then he sees her picture in a magazine about missing people and then he decides to report it years later. But when whoever went to go to the brothel to see, this is many years later, the brothel has burned down. At this time, Missy, was the family offering any kind of reward for information leading to Amy's? Actually, there was $25,000 and then there is another bigger chunk. I want to say 200, 200 250, 250,000, I think. From the family. I think the 25,000 is from the FBI. There is another sighting and that happened in December of 2000 in Barbados. There is a woman named Judy. She's shopping with her husband and she goes to the bathroom in one of the department stores. She hears these two men talking. She decides to make herself hidden in the stall and she lifts her feet up so that they can't see. And she hears them basically threatening a woman. And one of the guys says that the deal is at 11 o'clock and you better be ready to go. It's my deal. So don't mess it up. She waits until these two men leave the bathroom. She can hear this woman that's like seeming distraught at the bathroom sink. And she sees this woman in her early thirties and she's upset and she's trying to make conversation with her. She asks her where she's from. And the woman tells her she's from Virginia, which is where Amy Lynn Bradley's from. 
And she says her name is Amy. But before she can even find anything else out, she hears those two men come back and that's it. Later, she realizes when she's reading an article about a missing person named Amy, she starts to put the pieces together and thinks that she saw Amy Lynn Bradley that day in Barbados. So those are some sightings of Amy. Like I had said earlier, the Bradleys were doing all the shows. They were doing all the interviews that they could do. They were trying to get all the information out that they could. And in 2005, they were on the Dr. Phil show. And shortly after they do this interview, they get sent an anonymous email saying, we think that this person that we found on this escort site, we think that this could be Amy. Here, this is Amy. And she's dancing with yellow. This is Alistair Douglas. There was a person that was contracted to be the videographer for the cruise ship. And once he found out that Amy was missing, he then was like, I think I might have video of that. So he went back and he found this video footage, which then he gave to the FBI. But again, the Bradleys were not notified that this video even existed until at least a year later. Jazz is the woman that they had said was on the escort website. This right here is the photo of Amy from the night that she was all dressed up in the fancy formal attire. So here's the photo off the cruise ship. You said that the parents believe that's Amy. They do. Mm -hmm. And then what are the next steps? How do you find Jazz? The person who sent the anonymous email, I don't know what they sent other than the photo. And then also saying that it was on this website. But the website would have to be tied to a location if it was an escort service. That's not something, not like a cam girl. I wonder, could it be like a Craigslist thing, right? If you post on the Bristol on Craigslist and you delete it off, of course, it's not forever gone. But to the public visual eye, it would be gone because this was in the... Oh, yeah. Um, 90s, early 2000s. When this was 2005, started. but who knows when the picture was actually taken. We only know they got that email. And that so, one looks easily a decade older than Amy, but that wouldn't have even been possible. Again, though, you think of what stress or maybe drugs do to you, like your face is going to change. Definitely with drug use. And when we think about the human trafficking situation, we know that is a thing that happens that they keep you on drugs so you can't rationally get away. When you think of even just as simple as the lighting, I know that I come across pictures that like my family has that are actual tangible pictures. And I look the age that I am now because of the lighting and where we've come with with that kind of technology. So I think there's a lot of ugly factors that could play into it that would throw the scent off even just naturally without that being the intent. Did they send just the picture and say we got this off of an escort website? There's no link or anything because I'm like going down my delusional brain of there's a link and they could hire her and then tell her yeah that's what i understand that they got was just this photo it's like a leadless lead yeah unfortunately that's pretty much it with this case there are not a ton of leads there are the sightings that we cannot verify you said the part about how Ron saw Amy at 5:30 a.m i had never heard that before because in my mind i always thought we had from one o'clock a.m. to whenever. But if he saw her and then checked again and she was gone at 6 a.m., that's a really tiny window. That's 30 really, minutes. Really tiny window. She didn't come in to change clothes. She like, did change her clothes. We do know that she changed her clothes. So from whatever she was wearing when she was dancing, well, that's what I understand is that she changed her clothes from the two situations. But I would assume that's to put on pajamas or something, not to get dressed for the day to go tour the city. I'm not questioning the family, but I do think it's curious as to why you would stay in Curacao when it seems like the likelihood of her leaving the ship was so small because they weren't docked yet. I believe they were in the process of docking, whether they were docked quite yet, I don't know for sure 
Because that would mean that she is just going to wander around in her PJs. Without shoes. Without shoes. Get the no shoes. Aruba and Curacao are only 70 miles apart. So I'm, it wouldn't take long. So we know was- that she wasn't in Aruba because he saw her at 5.30 a.m. I had a problem with that because we know that he said he saw her from her waist down. So he only saw her legs, which, I mean, who else would it be? But also, I have a little issue with that because all he saw was that little bit of her, for one. And also, it's 5.30 in the morning. And you know how, like, when you wake up and you maybe not quite with it? Would there be, like, a clock in the room? But... Yeah, it's very specific. He obviously knows the time very specifically for whatever reason. What you said, Missy, that he only saw her legs. If it wasn't her, somebody would have had to have brought somebody into the room there because the only way to access that balcony, you couldn't access it from somebody else random coming in. So I have to lean towards it was her because who else would that be unless the brother brought somebody into the room? And it would have had to be, in my mind, another woman, because generally there's a difference between female legs and hairy man legs. (laughs) So so he saw her on the balcony that attached to their room. Yes. And only their room. That's what I was wondering. Is it like a open balcony? I believe it was the room. That's what I gathered. Then I see only one option here. But then... A half an hour later, she didn't come back into the room. She had to, she fell off. Yellow is one of the main suspects, but we know it wasn't like that was the last person she was seen with. It was her brother. If you take the eyewitness sighting of the two college age girls that said that they saw her with yellow. But the only way that would have happened is if she snuck back through the room, nobody heard her or woke up. She took her cigarettes, but not her shoes. It's possible, though, with the timeline, right? So we know she gets back to the room from the brother saying he talked to her. Dad sees her at 530 in the morning. The sighting of her was 545, I think you said, right, Miss? 545 is, yeah. So she could have been... Waking up on the balcony at 5.30, gone through the room. The only part with that is that's hard is if dad was up at 5.30, did he immediately fall back asleep for her to leave the room without him noticing? Maybe he just passed out. It's hard to believe that she would get out of the room without him knowing, but the timeline would work. There is that half hour window where she could have been seen by the two college girls with Alistair. Let's talk theories. And I always, for some reason, like to start with my least favorite theory or my least plausible theory. And then we'll go from there. One of the theories in this case is that Amy Lynn Bradley decided that she wanted to unalive herself that night. And so she just went over into the water on her own. The main thing that bothers me about this theory is that there are no reasons to support that one. I'm going to list why it could be or why it couldn't be. And honestly, she had just graduated college. She had a a job lined up before she went on this trip. She just moved into an apartment. She just got a brand new puppy. Literally before she left, she hadn't even picked the puppy up yet. She had all of these things that were going for her. And I know we can't say that that doesn't mean that it doesn't happen. And wasn't she also very afraid of the open ocean? And that's going to tie into the next theory too. But yeah, she did not like the idea of that open water. Actually, we're going to just segue right into the next theory, which is a very popular theory, is that she fell in. So she was on the balcony. We know that the timeline was very small. If her dad did see her at 530 and then also woke up at six and she's not there, there is the, the possibility she fell in. According to Brad, she was not feeling well. Maybe she was going to get sick over the railing or something and then accidentally fell in. She was terrified of open water. And I also did see something that said she didn't like to go near the railing. I did find out the railing was about three and a half feet tall. I guess it's possible that you could fall over that. That seems really short. For her being as afraid of open water as she was 
to the point where she didn't even want to go. Like, I find it hard to believe that she would even want to go on the balcony. We don't know how much she had to drink that night. Maybe her body was never discovered because it fell in. Your body probably is going to be pulled under the ship. And then there are sharks or sea creatures that follow the ship that could also destroy any evidence or any body that falls in. With the sharks that do follow cruise ships, because I've heard that too, when you hit water, there's an impact, especially oh, yeah. which mm. is going to attract the shark. If there was, whether it was intentional herself or someone tossing her over, there would be an impact that could cause damage to the body for blood, which is going to attract the shark. This was ruled out according to the FBI and the police only because, hold on, she was a strong swimmer. I don't see that because honestly, like you're saying, David, if falling in. Like, you're going to have that impact. It doesn't matter if you're a strong swimmer. You're under a giant cruise ship. We've even seen videos of people, like, walking by an airplane when the propellers are on. And and if you get too close, you get sucked in. They say to not get too close to a moving train because you can get sucked in under the train. I don't care how great of a walker or runner or how strong you are or a swimmer. You can't outdo those at a certain close range, right? I'd have to look at the exact footage, but there's some amount of feet that you fall. And if you hit water, it's the equivalent of hitting concrete. It doesn't matter how good of a swimmer you are if you're essentially getting hit, like landing on concrete. Impact could kill you. I was going to say. Oh, yeah. yeah. Exactly. I was going to say a lot of the cases will show that it's the impact to the water that kills you, not the actual drowning, which is why sometimes there's not water in the lungs for the asphyxiation because you are dead before, like on that impact, I guess. We do have to talk about the human trafficking theory. The theory is that she was taken off the ship against her own will and then also sold into trafficking. We've got the picture of Jazz. We've got the sightings. Again, we know that eyewitness accounts are not always accurate, but there were some sightings of someone who looked like her or someone who said their name was Amy could she have still been alive and living on the island? Obviously not because she wanted to be there, but because someone was forcing her to be there. We know that this is something that's real and that still happens whether people want to admit that it does. How do you get somebody off the ship though? That's a big one. It almost seems like if that was the case, they would have had to subdue her in some way and wait until... (laughs) Most everybody has left the ship. But also, how many cases have we heard about with people's family and loved ones being threatened so much that the person abides by, afraid their mom and dad and brother who are also on the cruise ship are going to be killed? Like, I could see someone saying, keep your mouth shut, exit the boat, I think mm-hmm. everything is fine. If not, your brother, mom, and dad get killed. And and maybe you have that little bit of hope thinking, I just get on the island. I'll find a way to get some help and I'll save everybody. Like I could see how that can play a fear factor. Yeah, I feel like I could see that more because that is true. How would they get her off the boat, especially with the timeline Mm -hmm. that we're working under? It's such a tight timeline that I feel like what you're saying, David, I could see as being more plausible then say something along the lines of they drugged her or something like that because timeline's so tight. And then also if you're taking somebody off that's completely unconscious off the boat, it would have to be just enough of a drug to make her compliant and make her still be able to walk because it's probably going to raise some flags if you're just carrying somebody off the cruise ship. But I could see that if she left her room and got involved with somebody that was going to try to do this to her, they could be telling her, oh, we've got someone in your room with your family right now. We've got your brother in there. We're going to hurt them. The only thing that I could think of something that could be different is if there were workers on the cruise ship involved when, of course, they have their own headquarters. They have the kitchen area. They could possibly have a way to maybe drug her. So I feel like they would want her to be alive, right? So maybe drug her and get her out because the workers do have different 
exits and entrances. And I'm just thinking of like the giant rolly carts that I had in college. So if they're loading and unloading stuff. I have a hard time thinking that it would be any of the workers, though, just because of law of averages. There's a thousand people on the boat and they only decide to grab one person for human trafficking. And then we don't hear about this happening all the time. But I would yeah. also like to throw out, too, as Cindy said, we not hear about this more. We hear about the white girls who have money, whose family has money, right? So if you are going to commit a crime, what better place to do it than when there's no law? When there's no jur jurisdiction or you know that somebody's not going to actually be able to, like, care enough to actually do a thorough search you only give a shit so much within the law for where you are because once you get past a certain area it's another jurisdiction they're not protected and when you think about it too like cruises and not that they're crazy expensive but those are things that people save up for Sally hallway where the dad mm -hmm. was like all right i'm moving to aruba i'll see you when i find natalie not everyone has that money so i think it is time to speculate janelle I'm going to go with you first. I have to go with Occam's razor here. I think she fell. She told her brother she wasn't feeling good. We don't know how much she drank, but if you already don't feel great and the boat is in the process of docking, maybe that wasn't a smooth situation. And if it's only three and a half feet, that's not comforting to me at all. So maybe she grabbed her cigarettes to go back inside like it's getting rocky and it was just an accident it does explain the shoes i just i don't know how she walked through that room with nobody waking up i always have a problem with people walking around without shoes on <laughs> i've been walking around that cruise ship barefoot everywhere janelle it's when janelle wonders how we're friends <laughs> <laughs> yeah. i, I think know. janelle wonders that a lot of what a lot of us yeah <laughs> It's the only thing where I can make it make sense. Jamie would be so disappointed in me right now. Jamie is. Dana, you're next. Okay, I might be taking Jamie's spot then tonight. Googling what I was doing earlier, if it was baby yellow we're going with, got her out of the room. The sunrise that day was at 6.38 a.m. So is it possible that he was like, oh, I know this really awesome spot to see the sunrise it's just like right out here. You don't need your shoes. It's fine. Just come out. And I'm not a smoker, but I feel like you would take your cigarettes to something like that, especially if you're going to be outside. And on the way, is it possible that he's like, oh, sorry, I got to swing by the club really quick. I left my whatever over by the band area. And that's maybe where the college girls saw them, or maybe they were going to see the sunrise and were by the elevator. Who knows? But I'm also curious as to what his crew quarters looked like because while he was a part of the crew he was also part of the band which it sounds can be like a contractor type position so maybe it's written into their contract or something that they had like better quarters or maybe it was instead of like four people to a room it was like one something like that is it possible that earlier in the night maybe she was slipped something in her drink and then that's why she wasn't feeling well that night. And she then went out with him, maybe did under the guise of seeing the sunrise. And she just was continually not feeling well and eventually went to his room, passed out. And then he could take her out onto the island on that crew dock in some sort of cart or something. She's five six, which isn't exactly short, but she looked like a pretty petite woman as it was. If we're going with the sex trafficking route, I guess that's my Jamie conspiracy theory of how that could have happened. Don't like eyewitness accounts in general, but when you have many people coming forward and saying something vaguely similar, it's kind of hard to discount every single one. That is my island that is not Curacao. I'm not exactly sure either what happened. Again, it was only a half an hour from when her dad saw her to when she went missing. So maybe she could have snuck back into the room or something, but I'm with Janelle that I feel like she got into the water somehow, whether by accident 
or if she's a swimmer, I'm assuming that also means she can dive. So if she was diving to get off the boat, but Missy, you said they were like on deck eight or something. That's quite a bit up there. So that would be hard. Even if they were like almost into port, if she was able to survive falling overboard, even though the cruise ships have surveillance and everything to watch for that, if they were close to shore, she could have swam into shore at that point if the cruise ship is going slow enough. And then if that happened, then I feel like the sex trafficking part could have easily happened. We've heard about some of those other islands being gateways for that. And it seems like all the sightings of her, she knew who she was, but maybe at first she didn't, maybe, and had some type of amnesia. I'm going way off the plank here, too. But yeah, I feel like she had to have went into the water. And then what happened to her after that? I could be with Janelle that somehow she's in the ocean, or if she was able to get out, then she was in the sex trafficking ring. But Cindy, you just put money on every horse at the horse races. <laughs> I usually do that with my speculations. I just make it nice and broad. <laughs> You're going to win something. Could be this or that. <laughs> <laughs> All of it could be true at the same time, or none of it. <laughs> but we, we've said that before, though, right? All these things, there yep. could be little bits and pieces of truth, and it's why we never have the answers, because it's all little things. Okay, David? I one of those cases where I don't know where to point a finger, right? But I did write down a couple of things that stuck out to me. Uh, the band member that saw the brother was like I'm so sorry what happened to your sister I could see that being a thing where not a lot of things were set into place for stuff like this but that anybody as far as like crew members band members could be alerted of these things to keep your eye out for this person and they saw the family member and was like I'm so sorry so I could see how that could be an innocent thing and even the parents saying on the island, you're grasping at straws at this point as a family member, and it would make sense. It would not make sense in my mind, I would think, to stay on a boat when I feel so comfort in knowing that she's not there because we would have found her. So, of course, we're going to stay on the island. So I could see that being a just desperate attempt. I do go a lot toward the sex trafficking I've always wondered, when it comes to the sightings, could there be things set up where a certain physical type person says, my name is Amy, but it's all part of the threat, or like, is it that one? Is it that one? Is it the one of the eyewitnesses that I did really get drawn to with their story was the very first one that kind of followed her around, and I, I was really drawn into that story. Now... The last thing that I had to say is the suicide thing, I could almost see that being more realistic than a lot of the times that we've talked about people committing suicide for the fact of statistics show that most people that commit suicide don't announce it. And prime example that I will end the speculation with is Robin Williams. You would think he was the happiest got the world loved him he had money in the bank like why would you kill yourself yeah i i think jumping on the back of some of the things that david was saying when you said her dying by suicide it was like there's no way there's just no way from what we know about the case what we know about her but i didn't have those things in my mind david just brought up robin williams other people that we know who have died by suicide that you just wouldn't know. And it's just like that thing where it hits you. You could just have no idea about anyone at any time. So is it possible? I think it could be. What I find tough about it, and I think Dana mentioned it, is that she was afraid of open water. So for her to die by suicide in that way, and I don't know the statistics of somebody that was afraid of heights dying by suicide by jumping off a building. I'm not sure about that, but... It is common for people to use their biggest fear as their way out because in their mind, mm -hmm. they know that is nothing that they can survive, right? 
So her jumping into this body of water, statistically shown, absolutely. We're all afraid of death anyways. A lot of people want to die when they're choosing to do so is by their fear. Okay, putting like that context on it, I think it definitely could be a possibility then. That's just how she would decide to do that if that is what happened. I feel like that's not where I'm going to land and hopefully I don't do a Cindy and just put everything on. I'm going to try to tease everything out and then land somewhere. I'm going to like hop around a little bit first. So when Janelle is saying about her falling over the balcony, I think that's probably the simplest answer with what we have. The time frame is so short. Her dad saw her at 5.30 on the balcony. At 6 o'clock, she's gone. So we have a half an hour window that we're working with. With the father potentially not being fully asleep and her having to leave the room without him noticing that she left the room. So a lot of factors that have to play in there. So I could see a situation where if she wasn't feeling well, if she's trying to sleep on the balcony and starts to feel like violently ill, like I'm going to throw up, if she just ran up to the balcony quickly, she had been drinking, the balcony is three feet tall, which I still think is insane. If she just tried to throw up quickly over the edge, could she have done it too fast and just toppled over? That may be the simplest answer for what occurred in that very short time frame. All of the sightings of her they're all along the same lines of each other. Oh, are they all of these people wrong? Like David does, I put a lot of stock in like the businessman, following around, seeing the tattoos kind of thing. There's more detail there. The woman Judy in the bathroom where she tells her where she's from and their name is Amy. Amy is a fairly common name, but still given the context of everything, it's very possible that could have been her. If it was sex trafficking, I think that either Alistair or one of the crew members on the boat would need to be involved. And I almost feel like it had to have been Alistair only because how did Amy get out of her room? Like, why did she leave the room? I guess it could be something as simple as I'm not feeling I'm going to go down to the restaurant and get a ginger ale. But if that's the case, why don't you put your shoes on? And maybe she just likes to be barefoot like I do and just was not thinking straight and went to go walk to get ginger ale because she wasn't feeling well. And then she came upon somebody like Alistair or another staff member. And then that's when they took their chance. But there's a lot they would have to work out just by coincidence for that to happen. That they would have to be like lying in wait of, oh, if she leaves her room, we're going to take her and then we're going to get her off the ship and we're going to bring her into sex trafficking. They would be working on chance, which is why I think if that's the case, Alistair would have to be involved because we know that she had contact with him earlier in the night. They were hanging out. Is there a possibility that she's on the balcony? He knows where her room is. He's at a lower balcony being like, come on down, come on out, let's go smoke a cigarette, let's go see the sunrise. And that's how he lures her out of the room. So I almost think he'd have to be involved. He's very stupid to say to the brother, oh, I'm sorry about your sister if he's involved. Maybe he's just that cocky that he's untouchable. I'm not going to get caught. Which makes me think that if that is what happened, this is like a bigger sex trafficking ring that Alistair is just involved in and he has people that are on these islands that he's working with that he's getting girls on all these ships randomly. And it's this very systematic thing. If Alistair's not involved in a sex trafficking ring, but he'd somehow lured her out of the room and they had contact that morning. If there was like a sexual assault that happened and the parents then are bringing the alarm bells so quickly, does he then decide at that moment, I'm going to kill her because... I don't want this to come out. It's getting too close now. And then when everybody's disembarking the ship, he can go out one of the service elevators, service planks or walkways to get her out in 
equipment. He's in a band. He's going to have big equipment that he could put somebody in to get her out. I don't know where I'm going to land on it, but I feel like there's just too many sightings of her to make me not think that she didn't make it off the ship. So if that's the case, I feel like I would land on the sex trafficking situation. I am going to tell you that I think that all of you in the SWAC pack are very smart. I think that you all had really good thoughts and speculations here today in this, in this case. Once again, I like these really challenging ones that we never have an answer to. I am going to island hop a little bit because that's where I'm at too. I feel like J Janelle, you came off real like she fell and I could see why that is a popular theory. When I'm doing these cases, I do like to look and see what other people's speculations and theories are. And the top speculation on Reddit is that she just fell overboard. Now, when we're talking about her being sick and not feeling well, it would make sense, except for the fact that she's not loving the open water. I don't see her really wanting to go next to that railing. But again, she was drinking. There's that. Or what if she dropped something and she went to get it and then she fell? Like, where was she throwing her cigarette butts? Was she going to throw her cigarette butt over? And then she went over? We know she's drinking. Like, maybe she did have an accident. I could totally see that. That being said, I really lean more toward the human trafficking on this case. I couldn't, for the life of me, until talking to you guys, and especially listening to Dana's speculation, could not figure out how or why she would go and sit on the balcony and then be there at 5 30 and then be gone by six this timeline was really messing with me too and I'm like something had to happen like I like what Dana said that made a lot of sense to me like Alistair could have been hey I know this place just meet me at this time and we'll go watch the sunrise together and maybe she was on the balcony and hanging out for a while killing some time and then she was going to go meet him and then Yes, it is highly possible that she was either drugged beforehand or after, or maybe she was meeting him for a meetup. Honestly, she's 23. She was slow dancing with him. Maybe they had an attraction. That was the plan. She was going to go back and, and hang out with him or whatever, right? But I really do think that all the eyewitness accounts and with, and Yes, I'm also the person that says eyewitness accounts aren't really that credible, but there's just seems like there's far too many coincidences or sightings or somebody saying, my name's Amy and I'm stuck and I can't get out of here to too many people that didn't know each other. So I really do lean more toward the human trafficking slash sex trafficking area here. I think her falling overboard would make sense. But I also think that there could be bigger things at play. And I'm going to go straight to Jamie's Island right now. I feel like there could be a, a ring. This could be a thing. And that's why we're not sending off the alarms. Oh, we're not going to alert anybody. No, we have to dock and we have to let people off the ship because you know what? Captain could be getting paid and don't sue me. Captain could be getting some money. This could be a bigger thing. And then when we were talking about how do you get her off the ship? And I love that. Carolina said it because I thought the same thing. Yellow, aka Alistair, was in a band. And you know that I also work with equipment. You have big stuff that you're hauling in and out. No one's going to know the difference. And especially no one's going to know the difference if you are not paying attention because now you're docked and everyone's getting off the ship at the same time. That's the perfect time to do it. And it's the perfect, I don't want to say the perfect crime, but on, honestly, who cares? No one cares. You're in uncharted territory. U.S. doesn't have any pull here. You're on a completely different island. I really do believe that's probably what happened. I hate to say what I'm going to say right now. So I do want to like just, I think the best thing that could have happened would have been for her to fall off the ship. I think that would have been the best thing to happen. I really hope, and I hate that I'm saying it that way, but I hope that's what happened. Because if she was trafficked, we know that's a terrible, that is, I couldn't want that for anybody. I know her parents believe that she's still alive, even though it's been 26 years. I do not 
think that she is still alive, no matter what happened at the point she's still alive. So when it comes down to it, I believe that she was trafficked. And then I think in the end of the whole thing, she was killed. I feel she was failed by a lot of people. Again, we say this a lot in these cases. If you see something, please say something. It has been 26 years with no answers. And there is a number for the FBI. If you have any information on what happened to Amy Lynn Bradley, the number here is 202 324 3000. Amy Lynn Bradley was declared officially dead. Her parents do still have hope that there will be answers or that she would be found. Unfortunately, until we know anything else, all we can do is speculate wildly. Thank you for taking the time to listen to our show today. We genuinely appreciate any and all support. We would love if you would please subscribe, like, comment, or download on any of your favorite platforms that you go to for podcasts. Did today's episode leave you with more to say or have a theory that we didn't discuss or even a case that you love to hear us talk about? Head on over to our Facebook discussion group. You can search SWAC Pod. S-W-A-C-P-O-D discussion group and leave any suggestions, comments, etc. there. To feel a little bit more comfortable via email, we can also be reached at swackpod at gmail.com. That's S-W-A-C-P-O-D at gmail.com. Any and all feedback is incredibly helpful to us. And until next time, stay curious, stay safe, and keep speculating wildly.